thank you all so much for being here. Um, you are the faithful few. Well, um, so you guys know a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Jonathan and uh, have the unique opportunity to be able to uh, see the inside of all of these tanks that you guys regulate. Um, so this is, this is pretty interesting. They asked us to give you the evolution of tanks from its inception until today. And uh, that's really a daunting task, but we're trying our best today to do that. Um, and how many of you, just by a show of hands, have ever seen inside of a fuel tank? Raise your hand. Okay, great, great. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever been inside of a fuel tank? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are certified for confined space entry? Raise your hand. You didn't get your hand up. This is a guy that needs to get a fine right here. No, I'm kidding. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's talking about the inception of underground storage tanks it really takes us back to the mid 1800s. Um, a man named Abraham Gessner, which many of you probably know this, developed a process, uh, process kerosene, which is really coal oil, which this was great because it, it offered a lot of unique benefits uh, than, than what they had at the time. Number one, it was easy to produce. Uh, it was relatively inexpensive and a big factor for most of us. It smelled a lot better than some of the animal-based fuels they were using. It also had a much longer shelf life than what they had at the time. For instance, things like whale oil. So this was a pretty unique, unique part about it. Well, that was 1849. In 1859, a man named Edwin Drake developed the first commercially successful oil well in the United States. And once this was developed and the need for petroleum, it just skyrocketed all over the United States and all over the world, literally. Hello. Thank you for joining us. So um, it skyrocketed all over the world, but the challenge was you had to have a way to transport this fuel and to store it. So check this out. This is the first form of underground storage tank. How many know what that is? Shout it out. It's a wood barrel. Um, now, we look at this and go, oh, man, a wood barrel, you know, seriously. But no joke, this is how they stored the first means of petroleum. Um, now, we use wooden barrels for a lot of things. You, uh, this is California, so obviously everybody knows that wood barrels are used for storing some wines. Uh, they're used for storing whiskey, beer, things of that nature. But you really wouldn't think they would be used for storing petroleum. But not only were they used, they were used to a great degree. Um, and buried. Some were elevated and, you know, just used with gravity flow, but most of them were buried. As a matter of fact, a colleague of mine, I was talking to him recently about this, and he said, you know, John, honestly, uh, several years ago, we, well, it's a long time ago now, we went inside of an underground storage tank to line it, to upgrade the inside wall. We got inside and realized it was a 6,000-gallon wooden tank. And, um, you know, obviously there was nothing they could do about it, but it's just fascinating to note that this was used and used so much in the inception of underground storage tanks. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures, um, but like I told you before, I'll tell you the same thing my great-grandmother told her sixth husband. So don't worry, because I'm not going to keep you long. So we're going to go just as long as we have to today and give you the streamlined version of this. Um, take a look at this. This is fascinating to me when we're talking about storage tanks. And if you're the kind of person that can be fascinated about storage tanks, then God help us all, because it's not a very interesting topic. But when we get to things like this, it is a little more intriguing. This is a rock and masonry tank interior. It's actually a bunker that was used to store fuel. And how many of you would like to regulate something like this? Um, it's, it's, it's not really one of those things you look at and go, oh, well, you fall into every compliance category you need to. This is terrifying, but this is the way they used to store fuel. Matter of fact, it wasn't uncommon for caves, rock and mortar, and concrete tanks to be used to store petroleum at all. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 1957 that the NFPA code was changed to exclude storage of fuel inside of concrete tanks. So even as late as that, we were still doing this stuff. Um, and, and some of the important things to note here is the, the challenge regulatory-wise wasn't so significant. The, the main concern, honestly, wasn't fuel leaking into the ground that would damage the environment. The main concern was you had this expensive fuel that if you were putting in a semi-porous vessel, could actually leak and then you would lose that fuel. And really it didn't become a regulatory issue unless there was an ignition source close by and the release was significant enough that it could possibly cause an ignition. Uh, otherwise it was just kind of looked at as, you know, uh, you take the good with the bad. So this was pretty challenging for most people. This one's really cool, probably one of my favorite. And some of you may recognize this right off. Have you ever heard of NORAD? 
in uh, Cheyenne Mountains in Colorado Springs. It's the nuclear facility here in the United States, well, one of the nuclear facilities. This is their fuel tank. It's a, over a 500,000 gallon fuel tank that they use to store fuel. Matter of fact, they will actually float the fuel on water to prevent it from leaking into some of the cracks and uh, areas there inside of it. But this is pretty fascinating. Inside of a mountain, they put a big door on it, and this is how they store fuel. Um, matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, this is still in use today. Um, don't quote me on that one, but I think it is still in use today. So talking about underground storage tanks. Many of us look at the UST environment as... Um, kind of a necessary evil. You can't have above ground tanks everywhere. A lot of the times the, the space that we're storing, it just does not permit the use of an above ground tank, so you have to utilize underground storage tanks. And really in the inception of these tanks, now we see up here, you'll see a picture of fiberglass tanks, steel, um, and some other options. And primarily steel was really the genesis, other than wood, of storage tanks here in the United States. Um, really, 1950s, 60s, and 70s, steel was the most common form of tank. Matter of fact, even as late as 1984, nearly 90% of every UST in the ground was made of steel. And it, they weren't always just bare steel. You had, you had bare steel, um, STIP3, and some uh, composite jacketed tanks. So utilizing all of these things really gave you a great opportunity to store your fuel, um, everybody knows it still is strong. It's probably not going to collapse on you. It's durable, and you know everybody believed that steel really would not corrode. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit later. But most of these tanks really weren't bare steel. As a matter of fact, even in some of the earlier tanks, they would be coated with an asphalt-type coating on the outside. So they really did a lot to mitigate corrosion. Um, the use of cathodic protection, as you, all of you know, was a big thing, and still is today for steel underground storage tanks. But now, manufacturing methods, they've changed quite a bit. You no longer um, have to worry about the way they used to manufacture steel. And this part's really interesting. If, if you have any experience or know anybody that's ever done any welding or metal fabrication, to build these tanks, has anybody here ever seen a tank being built? Maybe in a factory, we've got a couple people here, great. Um, this is, I, I, I know this is all relative, but it's actually pretty fascinating to see how they manufacture a tank now. They utilize these huge mandrels and these big sheets of steel that, that are bended and, uh, and contorted into these shapes and then welded in place. But before they had all of this modern machinery, you were really dependent upon the manpower of people to be able to place these plates and weld them together. So the production of steel tanks, for a while, was not as fast as, certainly not as fast as what you see today. And the supply and demand of steel tanks has had several different uh, ebbs and flows throughout the last several years. Um, now, with the onset of manufacturing methods which have changed, these people can make tanks so fast. Um, and by doing so, it it really gives people an opportunity to not only upgrade their vessels if they want to, but to do it at an affordable rate. The challenge um, of steel tanks early on was that the thickness of the steel could vary from one place to the next. Um, you had your, your minimum tolerances, which is what you were supposed to go by, but uh, one of my colleagues and I were talking at lunch today about in the, the, the 60s and 70s how some of these, these steel actually begin to change over time. As a matter of fact, we've been in tanks that were put in in the 50s. We've been in some tanks that were put in, in, the, in the, even in the late 40s. And you wouldn't believe it, but some of the steel that were used to manufacture these vessels was so strong, in fact, that they were still in relatively good condition at the time that we went inside of them. However, now we see the steel that's being used is not quite as strong as what it used to be uh, for, for various reasons but they still do meet those uh, industry standards. So, in the, really in the early 1990s, manways begin to, begin to evolve. The people know that they needed an, a means for tank entry periodically, so really in the early 90s, people begin to put manways on vessels. So a lot of times a new tank will come equipped with a manway. And this is great if you're in our industry. 
Um, what we do is we actually go inside of these vessels to inspect them, to make sure that they meet the industry standards, to make sure that they're compatible with the fuel that's being stored there. And if they don't have a manway, we actually have to put one in. And so it's always very convenient when we find that they actually do have some. So the tanks over time have, have been welded differently and different methods used. I'm going to show you, this is actually kind of neat. Um, this is basically a lifting lug. And if you've ever seen a picture inside of a tank, sometimes you will see two of these placed in the bulkhead. And what those were used for is so somebody could hold that, that steel plate in place while another person would tack weld it in so that they could at least get it to hold. Um, so a lot of times if you've ever seen inside of a vessel, you'll see these two little, look like little gripper pads down there. And what they're designed for is just that, for somebody to hold it in place while somebody else actually welds the plate on. Um, you know, it's a tough job. And you, you know the old adage about steel workers. These guys are as tough as, the, as tough as the steel they weld together. And you had to be in this instance to be able to hold these things in place before the um, the advent of all this modern machinery that made this a whole lot easier. That's just kind of a neat little, little topic for us. So the inside of a steel tank, if you've ever been inside of one, it's like being in a cave. You know, it's kind of creepy. Um, you're, you're in there and it's real, it, a lot of times it's real cool and you can see this great big cylinder that's just black as night. But this guy is used to store and house petroleum. And that's why it's a big important issue for us. So when we go inside of a vessel to test it, primarily we're going to perform an ultrasonic thickness test of the steel. What that tells us is the steel's thickness in its present condition. If you'll see in this picture, I've got a cool little laser pointer in here. I'm going to try and see if it works. You'll see here these little X's. What that is, is they're establishing a grid pattern of the tank. So if you ever have any body that says they are performing an ultrasonic thickness test, or UTT, of the inside of a vessel, this is how they're supposed to do it. They're supposed to establish a grid pattern, and typically that is a 3 by 3 square. And inside of that square, they're going to take multiple readings with an ultrasonic thickness monitor. By doing this, they, they are to log down each reading that they receive, and then they compare that together, they find the average, and if that average is still within 75% of its original thickness when that tank was first installed, and normally they would go off of, uh, off of about a quarter inch, um, then that tank is still considered usable for service, and in some cases can be upgraded or transitioned um, to, to another level of service. So if you wanted to go inside and upgrade a vessel to be compatible with, with certain biofuels, then this is one of the means that you would use to be able to do just that. So we, we asked the question earlier, how many had ever been inside of a tank? And I think we had two or three hands go up. Um, does anybody here, I don't, I don't think anybody raised their hand on confined space entry training. If, if you do or do, we got one back here that does. And I, I'm, of course, certified for confined space entry. Um, it, it's, it's something that's good to have. You know, dealing with confined space, it just, it, it's scary because a lot of times, you're, you're not aware of, of the potential dangers that could lie within. We were having a discussion earlier in the afternoon um, with an individual that came by and uh, was talking about an accident that had occurred. Um, they were dealing with a sump that was, I believe they said, eight feet below grade. And the individual was going inside, lowered down inside the vessel, and unaware, did not monitor the space before he went in. So he violated his confined space entry protocol went inside the, the containment and in just a matter of minutes was completely asphyxiated. And so one of, I'm, I'm assuming it was his partner or something, saw what had happened and you can guess what happened. He went down inside the containment to try to pull his friend out. Matter of minutes, he was asphyxiated. A third individual did the same thing, same result. There were two contractors that were on site who just saw this happening, ran to the containment, jumped inside to try to help people and barely made it out alive. And this is the challenge with confined space. As a matter of fact, they told us that during the, uh, the final autopsy, they were so concerned because nobody knew what had happened to these people, what they had come in contact with, that they were all in their hazmat suits with their monitors testing to determine the air quality around the actual bodies. So this is something that people look at and go, oh yeah, you know, confined space, just a hole in the ground. Well, that's a confined space. And if you're not able to monitor the air quality at, and it's not just at the entry point, but at different stages throughout the depth, 
it can be a challenge for you. So if any of you are considering taking your confined space training or anything like that, which we would encourage you to do, um, it always makes you uh, a little bit more effective if you have all that, that knowledge, which we know in this industry is power, um, to consider those things, and especially if you ever get the opportunity to go inside of a tank. So we've discussed wood tanks, we've discussed concrete or masonry tanks, and we've discussed steel tanks. Now, t really, the only ones that are still in use in regard to storing petroleum today, out of those three, are going to be steel. There are still some concrete containments that are around. We won't talk about those, and most of them are located in military bases, but there are still a couple that are hanging around in the United States, which is pretty cool, I guess. So this takes us to the next, next stage of evolution, which would be fiberglass or FRP tanks, which as you know, FRP is fiberglass reinforced plastic. And these tanks really changed everything about underground storage. Um, when they first came in, you know, you ask somebody, when, when did uh, FRP tanks become popular? Most of the answers are going to be, well, probably in the 80s, which is, and that's really correct. But really, the first fiberglass tank on record that was manufactured was actually in 1961. However, it took quite a long while for these tanks to become popular. Um, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for this. Anybody want to take a guess at what run, one reason might be? Just shoot it out there. What would be one inhibition about fiberglass? Corrosion. Lack of corrosion? Yeah, they wouldn't need sacrificial okay. What, what we're looking for is a reason that they would not be considered popular. That would be more of a benefit. That would be a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. But let's, let's just take a guess at what might make people a little apprehensive at first about storing this vessel. Yes, sir? It could be damaged in installation. It could be damaged in installation. Absolutely. Yes, sir? Absolutely. So structural concerns. Definitely. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. New technology. Anybody else looking for one more? Okay, great. So you guys actually, yes, sir. Would it be maybe people worry about how it would react if the substance is stored in it? Very good. That's it. The challenge at hand was in the 1960s, you, you didn't have things like ethanol that we have today. And, um, you know, usually ethanol is a bad four-letter word considered to be in this industry. Uh, but it's, it's a very unique concept. It's, it's a renewable energy. It's something that you could debate on all day long. But it's mandated in most parts of the world. So people have to utilize ethanol or biofuels. Um, the challenge was, can this new space-age technology really store something as corrosive as gasoline and diesel fuel? And... Um, so that was one of the challenges. The other challenge was there just was not very many manufacturing locations that were making fiberglass tanks at the time. And so if you wanted to order one, the plant might be somewhere here in California, and you might be in the Midwest. Your shipping costs were very expensive, and so a lot of times it was cost prohibitive to buy one just for the shipping expense alone. And then what would happen if this... If this fiberglass tank is damaged during the shipping, it's all over. You have to start all over again. So the shipping costs were a big reason. The structural integrity, you know, you've got a big, beefy steel tank in the ground. You know, I mean, just the word tank speaks of strength. And then, you, you know, you put this thing made of fiberglass hair. You put this next to a steel tank and it's like, man, there's no way that can be equally as, in or, or equally as strong. So there were some concerns just about the structural integrity. Can this plastic vessel handle the overburden? Can it handle the hydraulic pressures that comes with an underground storage tank environment? So that was another concern. And really, the, one of the biggest challenges that my friend touched on here is the installation requirements. To install a fiberglass tank, you know, at the time, there were a lot of new requirements that tank contractors had to take into consideration. Your backfill had to be a certain, certain material, you, it, you know, possibly sand or maybe pea gravel. And even that pea gravel, in some cases, had to be a certain size couldn't be over, uh, over such a diameter. You know, it wasn't like a steel tank where a lot of these guys just pushed everything they had back over the top of this tank. And now you've got broken glass and appliances and everything buried over the top of your tank. And, you know, the only way we know that's because we've had to dig a couple of these out. And it's fascinating what you will find. 
So those are really probably three main concerns that people had with fiberglass tanks. However, in, in the 80s, they became very popular because the actual manufacturing facilities increased and the increasing of those manufacturing facilities ultimately, as you know, resulted in a reduced price. So the availability was better and uh, it, it really made the FRP tank very popular into what it is today. And fiberglass tanks are an incredible alternative today to steel. And uh, most cases, tank owners today are usually on the steel line or fiberglass or some of them will have a lot of fiberglass tanks, some of them will have a lot of steel. We deal with tank owners all over the United States and you have some that have been here for the last 50 years and they are steel all the way. You know, I don't want anything fiberglass, I'm steel all the way. You have some other people that I don't want anything that's steel, I've had bad experiences with steel, it's gotta be fiberglass or I'm not interested at all. So, it, it's really kind of a matter of preference at, the, at this stage um, they have equal ratings that, you know, these tanks have UL listings so that they've been tested by one of the most respected independent laboratories in existence today. And, um, so they each carry, uh, their own range of benefits. So inside of a fiberglass tank, this is a tank that's obviously been decommissioned as you can tell by the bright light at the end of the tunnel. Um, if you look inside of here, you'll see what looks like what ribs. Does anybody know why there are ribs in a fiberglass tank? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Absolutely. Structural integrity. These forms give that tank the integrity it needs to be able to withstand the overburden and the hydraulic pressure that comes in an underground storage tank environment. Now, most of you, I, I assume, are in some sort of regulatory capacity. Being that you're in California, I would assume that some of you deal with storage vessels that are in a high water table. And how many of you, has anybody ever seen a tank float? You have, where, where was this at? At a construction site, I love the way you answered that. Any, anybody else, you, you said you've seen a tank float before? Oh no. Wow, that's kind of like the Titanic sinking, man, that's a disaster. Um, you know, and in some of those cases, when you're dealing with vessels that do have a high water table, they will require, what are they required at the middle of installation or at the final stage of it? What do they call those things? They go over the top of the tank, tie downs or straps or what they call dead men that are used to hold those tanks in place. Here's one of the challenges that you have. A lot of those straps corrode. And so a lot of times, a vessel that is strapped down for 15, 20 years, those straps, in some cases, actually could have corroded and so are no longer, um, no longer suitable. I'll tell you of one case where I've actually seen a tank float. Um, it doesn't happen that often. And if you use proper installation procedure and you're doing everything right, it is 100% avoidable, well, 99% avoidable. Um, you may have some instances where, like my friend here was just talking about. But we had upgraded the vessel for, and we're going to get into this in just a little bit, but we upgraded the vessel with a double wall retrofit, and we'll talk about what that is a little bit later. So the tank owner had invested quite a bit of resources into, this, into these tanks, actually. And um, the contractor who had removed the overburden of the vessel, for whatever reason, removed the entire tank pad. So if you're here and you're a regulator, let me, let me give you a little, little secret that I'm sure you probably already know. If you're doing any kind of tank repair and somebody tells you, we're gonna have to remove the whole tank pad, that is generally not a good idea. Um, most of the time, to gain access to an underground storage tank, if there's not a manway present, your excavation area only needs to be approximately four by four or six by six foot over the top of that tank. That gives you plenty of access to go down inside, cut, on, cut a manway if, if one does not exist, and gain entry into the tank. By removing the entire tank pad, you subject that tank to some pretty hazardous conditions. So this particular tank contractor on the other side of the world excavated the entire tank top which was okay, you know, it's, it's hot weather, no rain, uh, wasn't a very high water table. 
we upgraded the vessels, they were completed. Well, the contractor got busy with other things. Process of getting busy, he left that tank pad uncovered for about two weeks, um, which is a big no-no uh, for, for you know, several reasons. One, um, there's been instances where people have been driving along at a gas station not paying attention and have driven right into the containment. Um, and and it, you know, it's, it's potentially disastrous. Um, a common sense, a little bit of common sense goes a long way when dealing with storage tanks. And uh, it's sad to see what a gross absence there is of common sense in some cases. So in this case, we had that absence of understanding and he did not put the tank pad back. At the end of the second week, they caught one of the biggest rains they had ever had in that area. All three tanks packed their bags and floated out of the parking lot. I mean, they popped up out of the ground. And you know, it was, it was horrible because the tank owner now he asked us, can you recertify that vessel? No way. There's no way we can because now it's been taken out of its original environment and we can't tell you what had happened and then let you put that tank back in the ground. And uh, you can imagine the kind of blame game that was being played at that point. Well, it's their fault. No, it's not, partner. <laughs> you should have never taken all that off in the first place and then went on vacation for two weeks and let those things float away. Um, we're from the Midwest. Our corporate office is in Missouri. And a couple of years ago, we had a really bad flood. You may have caught it. It was all over CNN. A um, little town called Cairo, Illinois, was under the threat of being totally flooded, which would have wiped this little town off the face of the earth. Um, in order to mitigate this flood, what they did, our office sits along the Mississippi River. What they did, the Army Corps of Engineers came down and blew a hole in our, uh, in our levee, that which protects and blocks the river. They blew a hole in the levee in most of the area where we had is farmland. Flooded all of these farmers' fields. It was a big, big issue. Flooded all these farmers' fields, and most of these people obviously didn't have flood insurance. Um, because in a lot of those places, you just can't get it if you're living close to the river like that. So flooded all of these fields and everything. Well, when that happened, we obviously had more rain, most rain we had ever had in, in quite some time. Excuse me. Well, floating down the river, can you guess what we saw? Two underground storage tanks floating down the river. Um, a lot of the farmers in that area, they're constantly using heavy machinery. And, you know, it gets a little bit difficult to drive your tractor at 10 miles an hour to the local gas station to fill it up. So most of these guys will have diesel tanks, whether they be above ground or below ground, stored on their farms. Um, unfortunately, some of the installations probably weren't as good as they needed to be and caused these tanks to float down the river. These were steel. So as they floated down the river, they were eventually, you know, wrangled in. And uh, as a matter of fact, they were tested and put back into service. On a steel tank, that's something that you can actually do. It's very easy to determine on steel. So it, uh, it's, it's a problem that is easily avoided. So my challenge is to, to us here today is to stay cognizant and stay aware of the fact that, you know, there's something underneath that soil. And um, it, it has great potential to cause a lot of damage. That particular tank owner was out probably $300,000 just out. Um, and I, I still don't know to this day if they were able to work anything out with the insurance companies or what have you. Um, but it was a disaster that totally and completely could have been avoided. So you never really can be sure what you're going to find inside of an underground storage tank. There's just really never, you, you don't know. Um, and I don't know the... Uh, I don't know what falls under all of your purviews, so if you ever have the opportunity to see inside of an underground storage tank, but have any of you have any experience with strange and unusual items inside of a storage tank? Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll show you a couple here. Um, we have found so many things going inside of a fuel tank. You would not believe it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through off the top of my head and just name a couple. We have found bifocals, sunglasses, ink pens, markers, cigarettes, cigars, lighters, matches, flashlights, pipe wrenches, hammers, nails, screwdrivers, um, uh, sandwich bags, Doritos, 
All of these crazy things we have found inside of tanks. And it's not that the tank is, you know, like the missing link in the Bermuda Triangle where everything goes. It's just that you're usually dealing with somebody that's filling this vessel. And it's probably around, you know, noon, one o'clock. They're hungry. They're out there filling that vessel, chewing on a cheeseburger, chomping on some chips. Something falls out of their pocket. Oh, no, can't go get it. <laughs> so, and, and, and so they just hook that thing on, fill it back up, and oh, it'll dissolve its fuel. And they don't. Um, a big thing that we find is cell phones. We find cell phones inside of storage tanks all the time. And, uh, you know, can you hear me now? It's a little bit hard to hear when I'm, I'm full of fuel. But it is a challenge. And, and here's, here's the thing. If you are going to fill up a vessel, and let's just say that that vessel only has eight inches of fuel, okay? So you've got about eight inches of fuel and all of this ullage space before he fills. So in the process of taking that cap off the fill, looking down, drops a screwdriver out of his pocket, or maybe he's trying, you know, he can't get it off, it's, it's rusty, so he's trying to pop it open with a little crowbar. Pops it open, slips out of his hand, falls into the pit, or into the hole. Now, here's the problem with that, is if this is a, let's say a fiberglass tank, and that, that particular item, if it's metallic and falls down and it has some weight, there is a very strong possibility that that can actually damage the tank bottom. It can puncture a hole. It can, it can cause it to, uh, to have a perforation. And do you really think that most of these people are going to come to the station manager and go, hey, you might want to get this checked out. Drop my flashlight, drop my screwdriver, my pocket knife, my kid, you know, whatever it was. I, I dropped them down the hole. You might want to actually go check it out. No, it never happens, hardly ever. Matter of fact, um, I can recall a site in the Midwest where, where this individual um, technician was filling up a tank and he, you know how it is, he, he clamped it down. Well, obviously, he didn't have a good enough clamp. Clamped it down on top of the fill. And then there was this very attractive lady that was working inside of the gas station at that time and obviously needed a friend at that moment. So instead of standing by the fill, watching it like they are required to by law, instead of doing that, this guy you know, obviously needed to get her phone number. So went inside, was talking to her. We were actually on site getting ready to work on another tank. Um, during this process so we weren't close to where he was filling but we were still there on site and all of a sudden it comes loose and fuel goes everywhere now, this site was uh, was next to a a, um, a waterway and this it's diesel fuel just literally goes everywhere um, the the technician totally oblivious there were alarms going off you know, I don't know if he thought it was a video game. I don't know what he thought the alarms meant, but he didn't, didn't pay attention to them. So literally, hundreds of gallons of fuel is being poured all over the ground out there. So happened there was a, uh, an individual from the um, fire marshal's office there at the time. And above this site, which is at the base of a hill, there was a fire hydrant. I don't know what he was thinking. I think maybe he thought it could have been gasoline, and so he was trying to save the day, which is understandable. Um, our guys, being quick thinking, ran, and we grabbed sandbags and all, all of our oil dry, and we, we created a containment and a dike down the road, and we had all of these things set up to capture the fuel. So we knew we were going to capture it and hold it in place until the proper people got there to clean it up. Well, the, <laughs> the fire marshal goes on top of the hill with a wrench and just unlocks that fire hydrant and spews water all down this hill it hits the ground and guess where all that that fuel went right into the waterway and so by the time the regulatory authorities got there and they said so what happened here where's all the fuel of course there's no fuel it was all in the water and um, that was an interesting thing so remember it's very important. There are key stages in dealing with fuel that it's very important to pay attention. I don't know if any of you have ever had an experience like that. Um, to be honest, it happens uh, much more frequently than it should. Here's another fun fact for you that uh, happened in Florida. Um, you know how all of your, mon well, most places, the monitoring wells are painted what color? White, absolutely. So are usually pretty easy to distinguish from a fill, right? So we, um, this particular site had a fuel delivery technician show up, 
show up on site, hooked his fuel nozzle up to the monitoring well, and dumped 10,000 gallons of unleaded into the ground. They contacted us and said, we have a leak. There's something wrong with our tank. So we showed up on site and did a quick air quality, and we backed off the site real quick and said, uh, we can't help you here. This site is ready to explode. Obviously, the soil was emanating fuel. So they found out real quick, checked out the security cameras, and sure enough, there's the guy, happy-go-lucky, talking on a cell phone, dumping loads of fuel inside of their monitoring wells. So something so simple can have such a devastating impact on your environment. And as, yes, sir? Some of, some of their, you're, you're absolutely right. In some cases there is, in some cases there is not. In this particular case, uh, there was not. And the individual, I don't know if he was new. I don't know if he was having a bad day, but um, was very adventurous at that moment. And um, so, but you're absolutely right. There are usually a clamp locking system that you pop and turn to unlock the fill and be able to drop fuel. Yes, ma'am. Yes, in some cases, actually most of the time, it's painted, and a lot of cases there, there are uh, words written, sometimes they're faded. In this case, it was painted. Um, however, I don't think the words were visible, but um, that would have helped probably. Maybe a sign that said, hey, stupid, you know, don't do this. Maybe an arrow pointing, the fill is this way. <laughs> Something like that maybe could have prevented it, I'm not sure. So you never can really be sure what you will find inside of an underground storage tank when you go in there. Um, do you guys remember the way that we used to check the fuel level inside of tanks? You got it, and you did it just right, too. They would take those really long sticks out there and take it, in, and they wouldn't lower it down gradually and hope for the best. They'd take those things and throw them down, and boom. And the reason you throw them down is because they'll bounce back up, and you can catch it, and it's easier. You don't have to bend down as far. So they would boom, throw it, and this guy's giving me a thumbs up. Yeah, that's the way we do it. No, I'm kidding. But just throw it down, boom, and it would bounce off the bottom. You know, you'd pick it up. Anybody guess why that's a bad thing? It compromises, <laughs> my friend up here is going, eh, I really don't know. It compromises that tank bottom. And this brought us into what? Striker plates. You guys know what a striker plate is, right? That little, little invention sent from heaven that saves the bottom of your tanks. Even with striker plates, though, continuing to do this over and over can damage that tank bottom. And on older steel tanks, can you guess where the leak is usually found probably 60% of the time? Right under the fill. Um, and everybody's like, well, I just really don't understand what happened. You know, I, just, I guess there was something crazy. No, it's just over time you keep throwing these things down here and they bounce back up. And it's fun. I'm not going to say it's not fun. You know, it's fun to do, but it will compromise your tank and cause it to leak eventually. So that was really the, uh, the reason that, we f that, that tank manufacturers actually started coming up with striker plates because these sticks strike the tank, especially. Think about doing this on a steel or fiberglass tank. Over time, it doesn't matter either one. In this, in this instance, it will damage both. So we, we've talked about this um, quite a bit, and so now we know that there are some things hiding inside of tanks that are better than others, like it would be cool to find a wallet with money in it, but it's never happened. Um, but inside of tanks, there are also things that are very, very disturbing and nobody wants to find. This is where um, our company specializes in across the United States. We see and go inside of thousands of tanks every year, either via a robotic camera or manned entry inspections. So we have a very interesting view that many of you never get to see. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of things here. Um, and I don't know if any of you can tell exactly what this is, but the challenge, anybody wanna take a guess at what that is without reading it? Lost my little pointer, here it is. You know you read that. Okay, I'm kidding. All right, take a look at this right here. That's the bottom of a steel tank. 
that over time has corroded to where you could go inside of that vessel and actually push your thumb right through the steel wall. Now, the challenge with this is that this particular vessel passed a tightness test. Why is that? Here's the thing. Um, what's that? This is a single wall tank. Very good point. Very good point. The challenge with this is that a tank will corrode. And let's say your tank starts out at a quarter inch thick. And over time, for various reasons, that vessel will begin to corrode until that one spot, which was once a quarter inch thick, is now maybe, I don't know, maybe an eighth. And so, but it's still passing a tightness test because there's no release. There's no perforation. There's no hole. And a lot of times what happens is that the moment it does fail a tightness test and we get a phone call, hey, can you come investigate this problem? We don't just find this. We find spots all in the vessel to where that tank is no longer usable through normal means of repair because it has gone so far unchecked, nobody ever knew this was going on inside of the ground. This is a little, the lower third of a tank bottom and you can see along this side here, this is all corrosion. Anybody want to take a guess at what kind of fuel was in that tank? Diesel? Very good, very good, uh, very good assumption. Ethanol. Who said ethanol? Ethanol. That's what was actually in this particular vessel. This particular vessel was E. Anybody want to guess at the percentage? Ten. And this is what happened. Here's... And, and everybody's thinking, oh, man, those tanks are great. Why? And, and usually when we're on the phone with somebody and they say, hey, you know, we're due for an internal inspection. We want to have you come out here. You know, I'm pretty sure we're okay. We're passing all of our tightness tests. I'm thinking, well, okay, let's hope for the best. And, and more often than not, when we go inside of the vessel, this is what we find. And it's, it's not something that makes everybody jump up and down and go, all right, we got internal corrosion. And here's the challenge. The regulations uh, that came out in the 80s by the Fed really covered what? External corrosion. Here's the challenge that we have today. We've got cathodic protection, which mitigates corrosion on the outside of the vessel. But do any of you know any regulations that govern internal corrosion? That govern any of this? No. No. The challenge is we've spent all of our time concerned about external corrosion, which I understand the reasoning and the, and the principle behind it. But now, with the, the influx of biofuels like ethanol, like ultra-low sulfur diesel, these fuels are causing severe damage inside of underground storage tanks. Now, I'm not showing you something that I found on the internet. This is something that we took a picture of. As a matter of fact, I have hundreds of pictures just like this. Um, we've been finding this in tanks for probably, to this degree, probably the last eight years, nine years. And so there's still no regulation to govern internal corrosion. Um, and I, I'm going to be careful what I say here because I don't want to be offensive. But I believe we have a responsibility to to the tank owners that are out there, that if we tell them you're required to put this fuel in your vessel, but it's your job to make sure that your vessel is compatible, I think we, it's very important for us to have some measure of regulatory guidance that would be able to say, hey, you know what, we need to periodically check that, the inside of that tank, or you might want to make sure that you've done something to ensure that the actual steel or fiberglass shell is compatible. So there's very limited regulations governing internal corrosion, if any, in some cases. I want to show you another one here. See this right here? I don't know how well you can see that. This is an actual hole inside of a steel tank. Um, the fascinating thing is this was totally due to, uh, to corrosion. Has anybody in here ever heard the, uh, the word MIC or M-I-C? My friend here. Um, microbial influenced corrosion or microbial induced corrosion? It, it is a byproduct of utilizing biofuels. What happens is, on a steel tank especially, a steel tank probably will never corrode internally until you get water. The moment you get water inside the vessel, it's in some cases, especially when you have striker plates, it's very hard to get the water out. And almost impossible in some cases. 
So what happens, and I'm not going to go too far into this, but what happens is it creates a breeding ground for microbial bacteria. The bacteria produce, uh, their final byproduct is sulfuric acid. That sulfuric acid is literally what attacks the steel shell, causes severe pitting. I'm going to show you another picture here. You can kind of see the, the pitting that I'm talking about right in this area here, and then the actual perforations that take place inside the shell itself. Um, this is some pretty vicious stuff. And people will say, ah, well, you know, throw an additive in there, it'll take care of it. It's not true. Um, re remember, I said we go inside of thousands of tanks every year. Even tanks that had additives in place to try to mitigate this bacterial, bacteria influence. And it still could not handle it. So you have moments like this where now you have lost fuel. But the challenge was this tank was still passing tightness test. And it wasn't until this particular hole right here finally made it all the way through that they were able to determine they had a problem. Once we went inside, the whole tank was shot. We weren't able to repair it because it didn't meet the API requirements for repair. So in this instance, it's very important to, to understand what happens when you introduce biofuels inside of a steel or fiberglass tank. Now, I, I don't want you to think that I'm just picking on, a, on steel tanks because it, I, I'm not. I, I want to show you a picture here um, of a tank floor. Can anybody tell what that is? This is a fiberglass tank. If you can see right in here, it's the gel coats that's completely gone. This particular tank had E85. This particular tank was manufactured in the early 90s uh, with E85 that was being stored in there. Um, we have had people introduce ethanol blended fuels and in as little as 6 to 18 months contact us with a problem. And this is kind of like the elephant in the regulatory room that nobody's talking about. They are increasing the mandates for ethanol blended fuel, but nobody's talking about this particular part. And we unfortunately have to be the ones that raise our hands and try to educate tank owners and regulators alike to say there is a very serious and significant issue that's going on inside of underground storage tanks that if it's not dealt with will ultimately lead to a lot of releases and nobody wants that not at all um, we went into that tank because they were contacting us saying we're getting what looks like white hair in our filters we don't understand why we have white hair in our filters anybody want to take a guess at what the white hair was it was the fiberglass. So what happens, sir, is that the actual gel coat gets soft. It becomes like gelatin, if I can use that word, until it's completely gone. Where do you think that goes? Well, some of it, most of it gets caught up in the filter, but a lot of it will end up inside of, of cars and trucks and things like that, and then they have problems and nobody knows why. Sir? I don't believe this particular tank was. That's a good question. He's, he's asking a question for those of you that couldn't hear that about the UL listing on tanks. And just and to be totally honest, that usually comes down to the local regulator and pacifying the requirements of that particular regulator. In California especially, um, you know this probably better than anyone, regulations can change from one county to the next and uh, to a certain degree. And so in most cases, um, I have, not, I have not had anybody demand of us to have a letter from UL. I think we may have had an instance like that a year or so ago that we were able to correct and pacify um, and mitigate those concerns. So it's not, it's not a problem and it's not a, uh, it's not a common question. Sure, sure. So normally, um, normally the biggest concern is warranty of the vessel itself. Uh, is that vessel still under warranty? 
Um, usually from a regulator's perspective, their concern is, does that tank have a warranty on it? As you know, a lot of tanks in the ground no longer have a warranty. So when uh, a company like Tank Tech or, or other companies go inside of a vessel, typically that, that entry automatically is coming, whatever repairs we're making are coming with a new warranty. So now as the manufacturer of whatever system we are performing on site at that location, that tank typically will have a 10, in some cases depending on the system's 20 and even 30 year warranty. And um, so, like I said, it, it's not something that we, we have really a hurdle we've had to jump too often, but it's a very good question. So dealing with this particular vessel and understanding the, the absence of the gel coat that was caused by an incompatibility of the product being stored. Um, the concern about this is that most of these fiberglass tanks and again, you have to understand, we, we have best friends on both sides of the aisle, of the steel manufacturers and on the fiberglass tank manufacturers, so I, I want to be careful how I say this, but would you classify this as internal corrosion? Anybody? You would, sir? Well, I mean, kind of? Not really corrosion, what about that? Check that out. Okay, this is where obviously the fuel level was. Gel coat's almost completely gone. Okay, how would you classify that if you were looking at this and making the determination? Is that internal corrosion? Is that considered degradation? Is that considered delamination? Obviously, it is all of those things, but how do you classify it? Because it's fiberglass. Exactly. So this is the challenge at hand in dealing with some of these some of these tanks. Is obviously corrosion speaks to what oxidization, which speaks to rust, which speaks to steel, and so if you're looking at internal corrosion it automatically takes your mind like what you were just saying well it's not really corrosion but it's more so degradation it's really hard to classify but here's the number one classification this is bad this is this is terrible and what happens is this will eventually degradate to the point of a release fortunately california does have quite a few double wall tanks so if the primary of that double wall is not suitable Normally, if there is a penetration inside the primary, it's what? It's captured in the interstitial. You know. Um, it sets off an alarm. We know what to do. But in some cases, especially on single wall tanks, they're out there and they're, um, they're, really, they're really not being monitored to the best degree that they could be. And in some cases, uh, let me say it like that. Let me show you another one. If you look right here, anybody know what that is? That's the seam of a fiberglass tank that has been separated. It's been devoured by ethanol. Um, it's not something you want to see when you go inside a, uh, of a tank. And I'm going to show you a, a couple more pictures on this. If you look down here on the bottom, starting to my, my left, you'll see the delamination of the gel coat. So this is what it looks like when it's totally gone. This is what it looks like when it's, when it's happening. And so a lot of times you will get that. We have people that, um, as a matter of fact, just before I left, my office had an individual send me um, a fuel filter, sent it to me, and inside of the filter um, were all of these little, almost sticky anomalies that were that were all over the fuel filter. And he's asking me, "What do you think this is?" Well, uh, after having our engineers take a look at it, we would say that it's probably this portion right here that's being delaminated and coming through and getting stuck to the filter. So once it totally delaminates, you have an exposing of the fibers here. This causes a wicking effect, and as many of you probably understand that, is that fuel wicks down that fiber and continues to cause further degradation. Right here in this particular one, this is a rib. And if you'll see right here, that's that uh, wetted area. This is actually fuel that is penetrated through the rib and being captured in the rib cavity. So the problem with this is what? It will still pass a tightness test. You know, what's well, captured in a rib, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> but it's still being damaged. And it's just a matter of time before that actually begins to leak into the ground. I will tell you this. In our industry, like I said, we, we have the opportunity to see this firsthand. And the primary concerns of the primary fuel that we see causing a lot of degradation is E10, E85, and ultra-low sulfur diesel. Um, these are probably if I were to put them on the most wanted list, would be the top three. And because of that, it's very vital that people understand the methods and means available to be able to protect your tank interior from these outside influences, or excuse me, inside influences. And 
this takes us really to the next development in the evolution of tanks, and that would be the uh, process of actually protecting the tank interior. So this is going to take us into interiors like linings um, and secondary containment retrofit options. Before I, I really get into this, um, as far as, as going inside of a tank, I, I want to reiterate again, if you're a regulator and you see somebody going in, or you're an inspector, and you see somebody going inside of a tank, or you see somebody on a site, and they're doing something that is unsafe, don't throw up your hands and say, well, that doesn't fall under my purview. I'm not going to say anything. Say something. One thing goes wrong, and it can cost people their lives. Um, we have been very fortunate that Tank Tech has an impeccable safety record, but there are other people that have, that have fallen into this category of not following um, safety protocol. You know, let me tell you something. When you follow the proper safety protocol, you're virtually eliminating any chance of a problem, and there's always room for the inevitable. But if you take the proper steps and you're educated and learned on how to do those things, you really take a huge piece of that equation out. Um, and so you're not going to have to sit back and say, man, maybe I wish I would have said something. Part that really troubles me, um, I was involved in a class several years ago, and the particular individual was giving a presentation, and he showed a picture of what was an obvious safety violation in, on, a, on a tank site and showed this picture and in the middle of his presentation kind of chuckled and said, yeah, this is what they were doing. I just got out of there. I didn't want any part of it. And, you know, everybody laughed, you know, like some of us do at a joke. But, man, it troubled me because I thought, you know, if nobody's going to say anything, man, that's your job to say something. It's your job to be the bastion of truth and to hold people accountable to a higher standard to say, you know what, if you're doing substandard work, you're not going to work in my county. You're not going to work in my city. And this, this is something, you know, my mama said safety is everybody's responsibility. All the time she'd tell me, don't you get in a car. If, if they take off and everybody's not wearing their seatbelt, when you get home, you're getting in trouble. And so safety becomes literally everybody's responsibility. So before we go into this next, next evolutionary phase of tank interiors, I just want to preface it and code it with that. Dealing with tank entry. Now, we'll ask again, have any of you seen, been on site when a tank was being entered? Raise your hand if you have. One, two, three, four, great, great. Okay, if it was being done correctly, you probably would have seen something like the picture beside you. This particular thing is called a venturi, and basically what this does is it educts vapors, harmful vapors, out of the tank environment, lifts them at least 12 foot above grade, and then disperses them. In California, there are some, uh, some ancillary regulations that go along with that, but in most cases, this is how it is done. Now, does anybody want to take a guess at what this is? What he's, what he's holding in his hand and what he's doing? Yes, ma'am. He's monitoring the airspace. What's he looking for? He's looking for vapors. He's looking for oxygen. He's trying to determine the vapor level and oxygen level. Now, here's, here's a unique thing, is that nowadays, most of these monitors will tell you the presence of pretty much a, a, a large amount of different types of gases or air concerns. It'll let you know immediately if there's something there. So they call this little thing, it's very, uh, very technical, they call that a sniffer. And what that does is it sniffs the air. Most of these things are equipped with a, long, uh, a longer type hose, and in some cases, they will, uh, they will insert that into the vessel at different stages. And so they're testing the air in the lower third, then they're testing the air in the half point, and then they're testing the air in the top ullage. The reason for that is because you want to make sure that across the board, you've got a clean, clean airspace. So proper ventilation, grounding and bonding. If you ever see anybody using an electrical tool on a gasoline tank, stop them immediately. Well, Jonathan, that never happens. Oh, yes. Um, it's, it, it's unfortunate, but it does happen. I've seen it happen. I've seen the results of it happening. Um, I, I know of a particular, uh, particular individual that was utilizing an electrical fan and had been to, to help educt vapors, uh, had been already cited once by OSHA, continued to use it, and upon doing so, caused an explosion. It was a disaster that could have been avoided if somebody would have said, you are not using that electrical fan on this site. And so it's very important that you have proper grounding. Static electricity is the biggest detriment to a fuel site. In an instant, it can cause, uh, cause damages. 
So you, you obviously understand eliminating those points of that fire triangle, eliminating as much as possible so that you mitigate your risk, monitoring those vapor levels, which we talked about earlier, and then making sure that everybody's wearing the proper personal protective equipment, making sure they're wearing their Tyvex, making sure they're wearing their ear protection, eye protection, all of these things that are necessary for whatever level of entry they're going to be performing at that time. So number one concern, this is it. Safety first all the time. Nobody's going to, they may get offended at you, but they'll be alive because you said something. And so I, I want to encourage all of you to do that. Accessing the tank interior. Some of you may have seen this. Um, in this case, they're using pneumatic tools um, to gain access into the tank itself. Um, you, you don't see a lot of these pictures all the time, but the uh, lubricated area here is oil that they're using to mitigate any, any form of spark. Obviously, they're not doing this until they have totally educted the vapors. In some cases, not doing it until not only had the vapors been educted, but they have also intro introduced uh, material like uh, carbon dioxide or, in some cases, dry ice to completely inert that environment before they gain access into the vessel. So this, this is pretty interesting. When, when you gain access into a steel tank, they will cut that opening. Uh, they, they used to do, and honestly, a lot of, I say a lot, there's not very many of the companies that do this anymore. But some companies used to put on what's called a Band-Aid style manway. And basically it's just replacing the hole with the same plate they just took off and welding it back on. And then they will put some measure of like epoxy or sealant over the top of that. It's not really the best thing in the world to do. Um, the best thing in the world to do is to put on a um, reaccessible manway. And this is a manway that on a steel tank you would weld on. It has a bolt down lid that usually is uh, come equipped with a gasket or some form of sealant between the lid itself and the actual manway. It's usually bolted down so that if you ever needed to get back inside the tank, it's easily done. You don't have to cut, you don't have to do this thing anymore. Um, and then a lot of times people will actually put a re-entry shroud over the top of this which takes it to grade. So now you have a what? A surface access manway. That I can pop a lid, look down and see the top of the tank. And uh, this is the best solution because if you ever have to get inside of a tank, this is a surefire way to never have to do excavation again. Now, um, they also do the same thing with fiberglass tanks. However, instead of, of welding, obviously they glass on a manway. So inside of a tank, some of you may have seen this picture before. This, is, um, this has been used quite a bit. And it's a little lady who's going inside and actually uh, cleaning out the tank. Um, this is not a very... I don't know, what's the word? It's not a very glamorous job, this part right here. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen the show Dirty Jobs, this particular part was featured on that show a couple of years ago because it's just that. It is a dirty, dirty job. They go in. This is obviously a staged picture because her Tyvek is still white. They go in they, they, with these beautiful white suits, and they look very technical, and then they come out, and it's just totally opposite. It is a dirty, filthy environment. So they're introducing... Um, absorbents that are gathering all the fuel up and making sure that they monitor that fuel or that uh, vapor space each time they gain entry into the tank. The, one of the particular challenges with cleaning a tank out is I've seen uh, and heard of people that cleaned a tank out and then upon cleaning the tank they went to lunch. You know, finished up about 11 o'clock, let's go to lunch. Went to lunch and then came back an hour later, the, the, the vapor space was fine when they left went back into the tank, well, there's no fuel in there. You know, what should happen? It's a steel tank. What's steel? It's semi-porous. So what that means is some of those walls will absorb that fuel. And so in the process of leaving, that vapor space increases. And they went inside the tank. And fortunately, nobody, nobody lost their lives. But it was a very dangerous moment. And um, it could have been avoided if they would simply have checked the air quality before they entered the vessel. So one more reason why it's important to do that. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run you through this stuff as surf, surface preparation. Sandblasting. If you're going to upgrade a vessel with some form of lining for product compatibility. So if someone says, I'm introducing ethanol, I know that ethanol is a particularly corrosive fuel, I want to make sure that my steel primary is not compromised. So what they would do is they would go inside and they would sandblast. And I'm going to tell you this, the number one reason why a tank lining would fail is for two, well, number, there's two reasons, okay? Number one is the contractor. Number two is the material that they used. If you do not prepare the vessel properly, it won't adhere. So what they're going to do 
properly is sandblast a three to five mil anchor pattern so that when they do spray on their epoxy or lay fiberglass or whatever they might be doing, it has an anchor pattern to adhere to. And so now you have a mechanical bond to the tank wall itself. So that's very, very important. And we'll keep moving right along here. Now, this is the actual process of lining. So once the actual surface has been prepared, they would begin the lining phase, right? Um, this is basically epoxy lining. By utilizing epoxy, it is a spray-on application. If the contractor knows what they're doing, a three-tank lining installation should take about a day and a half to two days. If it takes any longer than that, there's a good chance the contractor might be a little understaffed or you know, maybe some possible other concerns that would be slowing the project down. What you see over here is actually hand-laying fiberglass. Fiberglass laminate is a wonderful way to bring your tank interiors into a compatible state with biofuels because the resins have been tested. They are, they've been tested by UL to, to note that they are compatible with XYZ fuels. And now you know that they're compatible. I can store those fuels with no problem. So these are your two primary means of protecting your tank interior using what we call single wall linings, okay? So we're moving right along. Once those things are completed and those installations are done, they need to perform quality control. So they're gonna go back in, they're gonna examine the tanks and make sure that there's, that there's no spot that was missed, that there's no void, that there's no perforation in the lining. There's a whole myriad of testing criteria for QC that we won't go into right now, but that should be performed to ensure the quality of the vessel uh, lining itself. So what you see here, these are both epoxy. This is a fiberglass laminate system. How many heard of a tank bladder? Right? I saw some of you <laughs> see a couple of people shaking their heads right now. Oh man, tank bladders. Well, I'm leaving. Okay, so tank bladders, not really that popular anymore, and this is why. Not really that popular. This individual, if you can tell, has got a vac hose, and guess what he's sucking up? A tank bladder that was introduced into the, into the tank. They put fuel inside of it. It could not handle the high concentrations of ethanol and, uh, and things like biodiesel. And so ultimately, here's where that tank bladder spent its final days, inside a 40-yard dumpster. And so by, and I'm not saying that every tank bladder is like that, but tank bladders have traditionally not had the best reputation in the industry. Do any of you have any, any instances of tank bladders being used in your area or in your counties or anything like that? All right, cool, so we'll move right along. I'm going to talk to you about co-structural secondary containment uh, retrofit installations. What is cold structural um, secondary containment? We go inside, or some companies will go inside of a tank, and they will actually build what is considered a double wall tank inside of that vessel. So they will build a, um, a secondary wall, an interstitial wall, and a primary wall. This particular system is no longer, I, I don't know if it's, if it's in use uh, anymore. It came about in Florida in about 2008, 2009. It utilized panels. These panels acted as an interstitial space. The challenge with this system is that it just was not viable. Yes, sir? Is it listed? Not UL listed. It's Florida. Florida has a different, Florida has a different requirement that does not mandate UL. As a matter of fact, my understanding there's only one county right now in Florida that does mandate UL. It's uh, Broward County. So it uh, obviously was not UL listed, but um, it was approved in Florida. So they use this system. Um, they, they weren't in business very long, I think maybe two years. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we have subsequently gone in and repaired a lot of these systems. I want to show you um, a system called EQ403. This system is now known as the Phoenix system. Um, this originated in Florida about a decade ago, and this system was viable. Um, it utilized fiberglass material called parabeam, which some of you are familiar with. This parabeam acted as an interstitial cloth. As a matter of fact, if you put it together, it looked like two pieces of woven fiberglass sandwiched between vertical pylons. Soft material, once you applied it to the, to the tank wall and applied resin, it cured out and created about an eighth of an inch space of interstitial all across the tank. So it's phenomenal. Um, they, of course, coated that with epoxy to create the secondary 
and primary wall, and then utilize that fiberglass material in between for the interstitial. Now, there were several hundred tanks uh, that were upgraded like this in the state of Florida. Every one of them are still up and functioning today. Um, they came with a 20-year warranty. They can be monitored with uh, positive or negative pressure, with a brine system, with a passive monitoring system. Any way that you wanted to monitor these things, they could be monitored. So that's what was being used back then. It eventually led to the Phoenix system. The Phoenix system is UL listed, um, and there's a big reason for that. It's because it's absolutely necessary. You don't, you don't want an inferior system going inside of a storage tank. And being that UL is the highest respected independent laboratory out there today, it's the highest standard that we go by. Um, the way that this system worked is remarkable. It's kind of similar to the first, except instead of using epoxy, they used fiberglass. So they would actually hand lay this particular spot here on a steel, they would hand lay layers of ounce and a half chopped strand mat fiberglass utilizing a UL listed resin for, for com fuel compatibility. Then they would lay the interstitial material, which is we talked about being parabeam. Then they would go over the top of that and create their primary. So any of you that know anything about tank manufacturing know that this is pretty similar. Matter of fact, when they manufacture a fiberglass tank, they typically do this on a mandrel, right? And sometimes they utilize chopper guns to do that. We don't do it because it's not safe to do inside a confined space where you're atomizing things like resin. So everything we do is hand laid. But this is how it was done. They create the secondary wall by hand laying layers of fiberglass, create the interstitial space, and then the new primary wall. Thus so doing, you have now a double wall fiberglass tank that you can monitor continuously. Now, the thing about this system is it is still dependent upon the host tank. So that host tank has to meet the API criteria to be upgraded. It has to be within 75% of its original thickness when it was first installed. So if that tank did not meet that criteria, you couldn't use this system, right? So we're going to move right along. This takes us to self-structural secondary containment systems. So we just looked at co-structural, which means they rely somewhat on the host vessel. So Obviously, self-structural means that they are independent of, them, of, of the host vessel. So I don't know if any of you have heard of a system called Retank. It's, uh, it, it's been around a while. It's not, I don't think it's used that often. But um, basically, they take uh, rigid fiberglass panels, and they have to cut a pretty significant area out of the top of the tank, which we talked about this earlier. I don't really like it when people have to do that because you're removing a lot of overburden. Um, they insert these panels. Those panels are subsequently glassed together to create a single wall fiberglass tank. Now, technically, that single wall tank, if the outer tank corroded, would stand by itself. However, it's not double wall. It's single wall. So to create a double wall space, you're depending upon your host vessel, the space between this new vessel and the host vessel. So if the host vessel is ever compromised, your interstitial is compromised. So I, I think that's part of the reason why it's not as popular. This takes us to uh, a system that was, that was brought out in um, last year, I believe, called the standalone system. Now, this is the first of its kind, which has been tested to the UL 1316 standards, has met all of those criteria, and now the way they build this tank is they go inside, and I'm going to show you one more slide of really how it's built. They go inside and fiberglass the, the secondary. They create the interstitial, like what we talked about uh, and the previous system, and then they create the new primary. But the biggest difference are these support structures. These support structures give this tank what it needs to be able to stand in the event that this outer tank ever corroded away. As a matter of fact, during the testing procedures, they built this tank inside of a steel tank, which was hinged. Once the tank was completed, they unhinged the tank, the steel tank, and removed the fiberglass tank out of the shell. So you had an independent double wall fiberglass tank which was then buried and subjected to all of the UL 1316 testing criteria, which is the same as what? Brand new tank. And it passed with flying colors. So this is a remarkable option. As a matter of fact, in the state of California, this system has been introduced. It uh, is still waiting on um, the approval, it's been there for quite some time, and we know that, uh, that those guys in Sacramento seem to probably be a little understaffed sometimes and are very busy. So we're waiting on its approval out of the state, but it's already been approved in several states. Why? Because it has a UL 1316 listing. So to say no to this would be like saying no to putting a new tank in the ground. Um, and upon burying this system, they tested 
the primary, the interstitial, and the, the external walls for the, for the structural integrity, for the hydraulic pressures that they would undergo while being buried into the ground. And like I said, it passed with flying colors. So the benefits of these systems are, are pretty, pretty significant. Number one is they're about half the cost of tank replacement. That's a huge thing for somebody that's got maybe 15, 20 locations, and now you look at maybe saving them three or four million dollars just by going with this route. You do not have to excavate nearly as much as you do for a tank replacement. Um, so you have that benefit as well. The other factor is downtime. Typically a three tank site is upgraded in about five to seven days versus however long it takes you guys out here to, um, to do a full pull and replacement. Um, so this really is the latest evolution in tank interiors, the standalone system. And it takes us from the beginning of our talk today, dealing with wooden tanks, all the way through of how we make sure that they're compatible with corrosion issues into what you're seeing here today. A tank that you can go inside, build, the outer shell is totally inconsequential at that moment. And this tank would stand alone by itself and it's, uh, the typical warranty on this system is 30 years. So in a nutshell, today I've tried to give you as much information as I could cram into your already full heads because you've had a busy week. And I hope that you're able to retain some of this or mull it over. And if you see some of these things in your areas, I would encourage you to go to those sites and actually watch them being installed because it will give you so much better understanding of how these systems actually work. So we will actually conclude our talk today um, on this system here and then we'll take the next oh, probably 15 minutes or so for any questions that you may have. So now we'll open up for any questions at all. Yes, sir. We have, and that would be ultra low sulfur diesel. Yeah, just I'm going to repeat your question back for my film buddies over here. His question is, did we see any damaging effects or delamination on fiberglass tanks with uh, diesel fuels? And the answer, of course, is yes, and that is on ultra low sulfur diesel. Um, we've seen similar de delamination. As a matter of fact, in some cases, we're seeing some very strange things come out of these tanks. Um, I was uh, at a tank conference a few months ago, and uh, one of my colleagues brought, brought a picture up that he had found inside of a containment of an ultra low sulfur diesel tank, which looked like coffee grounds. And I don't know if you guys have seen those here, but it's kind of a strange anomaly that comes with ultra low sulfur diesel. Any of you have any experience with that out here? Great. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, very good question. His question was, is this system, speaking of the standalone system, a proprietary system? And the answer is yes, it is. Um, this is not a system that you can franchise out like what you saw in the 80s and 90s with some of the, uh, the lining companies that came out there. I mean, it's sad, but it's true. There were people that opened up tanks and dropped a bucket of enamel paint in the bottom of it and said, you're good to go. And uh, made a lot of money, got out of business and sitting on a beach somewhere and uh, 1998 rolled around and all of a sudden we're going inside of these tanks and going, oh my goodness, this is insane. Tank Tech is one of the only companies that actually was in business in 1985 and still in business today under the same name, same location. And longevity in this industry is really saying a lot. So when our engineers came up with this system, um, never with any of our technologies, and we've developed several that we hold patents on, um, never with any of our technologies have they ever been... Uh, have they ever been allowed to be franchised on these double wall retrofit options? So um, the answer to that, in fact, is yes, and that's a good reason to be concerned. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, it's like we said at the beginning of talking about working on the inside of tanks. It is so much so contractor dependent. And if you, <laughs> if you have somebody rolling on your site that you're uncomfortable with, you need to say something. Pull your rule book out. See if there's any violations. Make a phone call. I mean, do what you need to do to ensure that whatever's being done is being done safely and also that they're following the proper quality control procedures. 
Um, if a system is UL listed, there is a standard out there that you can go by, an installation standard that you can go by to say, you know what, all of these things have to be done and have to be done in sequential order, and if they're not, we've got a problem. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Your, great question. Anybody else? Anybody else? We'll hold for just a moment longer. Anybody have any questions something other than tanks? No? Okay, good. Good talk. <laughs> so, I hope you guys have enjoyed today. Um, I want to encourage you, like I said, to find out what's out there. You know, as a regulator, the biggest requirement is that you are aware of what is happening in the market. You're aware of what's happening inside of fuel and storage tanks. It's so important to take time to study and to take time to see what people are saying about these things. So I do want to make this available to you is that um, at any time you're, you feel free to contact our toll-free number and uh, we will be glad to talk to you and tell you what we are seeing in tanks and what we are seeing in tanks in your area. Um, and we just we have the privilege to be able to do that, and that's at no charge to you. My friend back here, I saw you raise your hand. Do you have a question? On the fiberglass tanks, when did they change the more compatible resin? If you look that up, it's going to say right around 2000. Um, late 90s, early 2000s is really when they started to change. Um, I will tell you that we have been inside of tanks that um, fall into that date category that are still experiencing some of the same problems, um, which is unfortunate, but, and it's hard to say why, but it's just the, the nature of the beast. However, I will say that most, most of your fiberglass tanks and steel tanks being put out there, even on some steel tanks, they're lining them internally at, at the manufacturer's level to handle some of these corrosive fuels. And so the manufacturers are really doing a great job to mitigate these problems, especially for the future. Because you know, who knows, 10 years from now we're sitting down here and I may be talking about some new type of corrosive bacteria that's suddenly come to, to fruition after a mandated fuel. So it's, uh, it's kind of hard to know for sure, but um, the cutoff date is late 90s, early 2000 is when the two largest tank manufacturers uh, would have changed over to uh, understanding and handling these fuels. Yes, sir. Um, you're not required to on the tank itself. Um, it was designed in such a way that it can and that it cannot. So if, you're, if you don't want to maintain cathodic protection, if you'll look right here, um, if you can see this, this particular area, see how that's fiberglass coming up through the tank hole? So that what they've done is at every point, even at the bungs, you'll notice in the bung the same thing as well, they have terminated the steel in that area to where they have built from the inside up out of fiberglass. So they've terminated every significant connection of this fiberglass vessel with the steel tank. Now, if you have steel piping or something in that nature, yeah, maintain your CP because it's not gonna help you with anything like that. But if you're looking at just working exclusively with the underground storage tank, and you know what, I don't wanna install CP or I don't wanna maintain it, this particular system can do away with cathodic protection if, if uh, so desired. Anybody else? Okay, great. Well, we, uh, the hour is upon us. And um, I want to thank all of you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to come here and share a little bit with you about uh, underground storage tanks. And um, it's, it's kind of one of those things that you don't talk about a lot, but um, I'm thankful that we do talk about it enough because this is happening and constantly being developed in your area. I mean, and I will tell you this, some of the pictures I showed are in your backyard and um, literally in your backyard. And so don't look at this as something that's happening in New England or, you know, in the Midwest. This, this is happening primarily out West. Um, and there, there are various reasons why that could be. Um, and I, I'm interested to hear some speculation on that. But we go into thousands of tanks every year. And some of those pictures that you saw came from tanks right in this area. So um, I just want to drop that in your hat and let you mull that over for the next several weeks. Yes, sir. Well, that Midwest corn. That Midwest corn. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It is our fault, and it's your fault that our food prices have gone through the roof. But no, that, you're absolutely right. Um, so it's 4.30, and uh, 
And uh, we, we talked about being able to go ahead and, and cut off at 4.30, so I'm not going to keep you a moment longer. Thank you guys so much. I'll be standing up here if you have any questions or anything like that. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.